Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nate Nibblink. I am the creator of Apples and Genos, originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy. And in this podcast, Blake and I are going to run through the last four days of the NHL schedule and talk about our fantasy seasons and the lessons we learned. Let's hit it. <laughs> And of course, I have your friend and my best friend, the man with the greatest cake, Blake Creamer. Blake, how are we feeling tonight? The greatest cake? Oh, what? You know, that's. Do you ever watch those baking shows, Nate? Because I'm kind of into that. And like, I literally, um, you know, if I had it to do over again, right? Like, money's no object. I would legit go to baking school. So I don't know. Right. We we have some synergy here. Like, I, I I like baking. You know what I mean? Although I'm not a very organized person, so I'd probably just like slap the flour in. It would come out like all melted and weird looking you know what i'm talking about i don't know what you're talking about i oh, do feel God. like i may have made a reference that uh is from a decade that you're not a part of so i apologize for that in advance but uh maybe we should continue on and get into the week 26 schedule what's left of it here there's four days left of some people's fantasy seasons not our fantasy seasons blake we've wrapped everything up but for the poor souls toiling still in the trenches trying to eke out their fantasy championships we are going to provide just a little bit here uh just briefly we'll run through the schedule i will say if you have not already checked it out we did do a waiver wire show back on episode 297 of the podcast so if you need to uh, go check that out and you can definitely get all of our takes. We covered the entire week 26, including these four games and what you can do, you know, between the weeks. So uh, much more of our takes about that is in there and what teams to uh, target and whatnot. Obviously, there's been some things that have transpired between then and now, but uh, just a quick refresher. So on Monday, we have eight games, Tuesday, eight games, Wednesday, four games, Thursday, six games. So all fairly light evenings in the NHL probably going to be able to get some players in on each one all of them um the Edmonton I should say is the only team that has three games played they don't have much to play for that could lead to some more minutes for guys that are down the lineup so do be cognizant of that and then there are five teams that play Monday Tuesday back to back and you've got Boston Detroit Montreal and Ottawa there so definitely you can check out those teams uh, did I say five teams I meant four teams there um, but yeah definitely you can check out those teams if you want to get a quick head start uh, in this back end of the week uh, if you got a spot open you want to maybe you have two ads left and you want to get a quick back to back out of a player and then maybe go for a goalie stream on Wednesday or Thursday that can be a really good way to do it there are three teams that play on Monday and Wednesday that's going to be the Islanders uh, Pittsburgh Penguins and Tampa Bay Lightning the Edmonton Oilers do as well but they also have the third game played on the Thursday as well um, and then Toronto's the only team that has a Tuesday, Wednesday back to back. So they're in the mix there as well. And then you got six teams that play Tuesday and Thursday. That's Calgary, Chicago, Seattle, Vancouver, Vegas, and Winnipeg. I'm not going to really dig into all the specific players off every single one of these teams. If you've got any decisions that you need to make in the last part of the schedule, please hit me up, hit Blake up. Uh, we'll get you through it. You know, provide us who you're thinking about, what days you have openings in your starting roster. Um, if you got any constraints that way, that'll help us. If it's categories, obviously, you know, give us where your categories are at and give us your roster and uh, give us some idea of what you're up against, and we can talk you through it. You know, hit us up on Twitter. If you're in the Apples and Juno's Discord, that's the best place to get a uh, hold of us. You can dm us in there uh or just tag us you know in one of the main channels that works as well uh definitely in this last few uh last few days of the nhl season i want to make sure that we're bringing everybody to the finish line here i know a lot of my personal workload in terms of fantasy hockey has dwindled at this point in the season a lot of people are already done with their fantasy seasons like i am and so 
I just have a lot more time and availability to help people out. So if that's you, by all means, reach out to me, reach out to Blake. We would be absolutely happy to, yeah, just help you out, help you get across the finish line, help you bring home a championship. If you have won a championship or you're getting close, um, then by all means, uh, just, uh, just uh, hit us up uh, in the same way. Uh, tag us on Twitter, whatever works. Let us know about your how well it went in the in the finals, or if you lost in a heartbreaking fashion. Uh, all those stories are good to hear. Good to commiserate with other people who've done the same thing as well. Uh, whatever works uh, is good for me. So, um, yeah reach out don't be a stranger we want to enjoy this fantasy hockey experience together um so yeah don't be a stranger reach out uh one thing that i do want to get into before we get into kind of what's going to be the i guess the main portion of this episode i do want to just reach out and say if you're in the toronto area i am going to be hosting a meetup in the toronto area in downtown toronto i should say uh april 27th this saturday so if you are around and uh i mean you don't have to be from the toronto area if you want to come to toronto for april 27th and and be there for that then by all means uh yeah head out this way and i'll uh i'll be happy to meet some people uh last year we had, met some people it was great we had a great time it was a small crowd but it was kind of fun that way too and this year i'm really hoping that we can do something similar again maybe we'll have some more people this time around obviously the the discord and the listeners have grown uh, by a lot so maybe we'll have a bunch more people come out that'd be awesome i'd love to meet more people this time around i'm um, still working out the details of exactly what we're going to do but uh, rest assured we'll be getting some drinks at some point and uh, yeah just get in, spending some time getting to know people shake hands um yeah i just want to meet some more people and and talk some fantasy hockey and yeah meet people in real life a lot of the times uh, a lot of the relationships that we have in this game because of uh the online nature of it are kind of impersonal in a way they they sometimes feel personal because of you know I mean, there's some people that I've DM'd like a thousand times this year, just back and forth, uh, talking strategy about their lineups and stuff, but never had the chance to actually meet them or put a face on the the username. So stuff like that is always great to do. So if you are uh, available to come to Toronto uh, to meet up with us April 27th, then definitely don't hesitate to reach out. I've made a Discord channel for this in the Apples and Geos Discord server. You can check that out or you can DM me and I'll make sure that you get the details one way or the other all right so basically the main gist of this episode is one thing that we do every year here at apples and genos um, basically we go through our teams we kind of evaluate the season that was how we got to the place that we ended up at the end of the season um, mistakes that were made along the way uh, good decisions that were made along the way that maybe we can learn something from basically the whole idea is that we want to learn from the season that was and carry forward the things that were good and to learn from and uh, leave in the past the things that should be left in the past, the things that uh, hindered us from our fantasy hockey goals. So for myself, uh, just to preface, I was in three redraft and one keeper league this year, four leagues in total. Uh, two of those redraft were head-to-head -head points, and one was a head-to-head -head banger cats league. So I'm just going to lean into it here with the We Call Ourselves Experts League. This is the league that I run. It's a 12-team head-to-head points league. It is the keeper league, so we keep three players every year. There's no stipulations. You can keep any three players uh, any year. So just keep your best three players and your first three picks every year are those three players. The draft starts in the fourth round. Uh, there's lots of managers that you would probably know in this league. Uh, Blake's in the league. Uh, Josh is in the league. Banksy's in the league. Mark Barber, 18 Skaters, is in the league. Raj from Five Holes in the league. Devin from... Um, um, 
Devin from uh, Fantasy Hockey Hacks. Sorry, I'm brain fart there. Devin from Fantasy Hockey Hacks is in here. Fired Up Fantasy, Jared's in here. And James uh, Fantasy Hockey Trades is in here as well. So there's lots of people that you probably recognize if you've been around the fantasy hockey space or community for any length of time. Lots of really good managers in there. And then we've got some sharp managers uh, that we picked from the Apples and Genius Discord in there as well. Uh, so in this league, I had won the championship last year. And uh, I traded a bunch of this year's picks to get there last year. So I was trading away my futures to get that championship. It did come through for me. I was able to win last year, but did mean that uh, I didn't have all my picks. didn't have a full complement of picks uh, this year. So that was definitely a tough spot to, uh, to start from. In the end, I finished ninth in the league. Uh, I finished sixth in the league in regular season points four. So that was still like decently good in my mind, considering that I uh, started from behind in terms of the drafts. Uh, but overall, I was relatively happy with the finish. I was trying to obviously win out the consolation in this league. If you win the consolation, you get the first, uh, the first pick overall. So that's what I was trying to do. I uh, wasn't able to pull it home, so I'll get the third pick instead there with the ninth place finish. Uh, but overall, uh, relatively happy with the campaign still. Uh, in the draft, I kept Rantanen, Yossi, and Zibanejad. Zibanejad was a bit of a disappointment, but Rantanen and Yossi were obviously just as good as I had hoped and thought that they could be. Um, my best picks in this draft, Carter Verhage at 60 was definitely a good one. Brad Marchand at 84 turned out to be pretty solid. Uh, best two were probably Brandon Hagel at 176 and Brock Besser at 181. Um, both players stayed on my team the entire season and provided a lot of points for me. So those, uh, were really great to have, uh, very late in this draft for sure. My worst picks, uh, I took Drake Batherson at 61. Doesn't sound terrible on the face of it, but Travis Konechny, Victor Hedman, Sam Reinhardt, and Philip Forsberg all went within the next 10 picks, which makes it a little hard to stomach in retrospect. Um, other than that, you know, I didn't have a lot of early picks to be messing up, right? The first three were all keepers, and then the next bunch were not, you know, terrible picks, but I did miss on most of my later picks. Like, I took a Bowen Byram, I took a Jakob Vrana, I took an Andrew Mangiapane, um... I stashed Brandon Montour and Max Pacioretty, so I was stashing players there. Yeah, overall, um, uh, didn't really have much beyond that, much in the way of picks uh, to mess up. The later picks, I mean, you're never gonna, you're never gonna be too sad if your, you know, 132nd overall pick uh, doesn't work out. So uh, that's about as bad as it got. Best ads, so I. Picked up Yuri Slavkovsky, not after the kind of initial breakout. If you'll remember, he kind of had an initial breakout uh, past the halfway point of the season. Then he had a cold stretch. He was dropped, and I picked him up after that. Uh, and then obviously he was pretty great till the end of the season. Um, then I had Wyatt Johnston, who I picked up on February 19th. I had Matt Duchesne. Uh, Put a $16 waiver actually in for Matt Duchesne uh, December 4th and kept him for the rest of the season. Um, I'll get to it, but I actually had Duchesne on my roster twice in this season, uh, but kept him after that point, and he was obviously terrific all season. And Stuart Skinner, October 30th, he was dropped very early in the season. And this is a league that really devalues goaltenders. <laughs> it's a league that I commissioned, so you might not be shocked by that uh, that statement overall. But yeah, Stuart Skinner had a really rough start, if you'll recall. He was dropped very early in this league. I picked him up, and I did hang on to him for pretty much the entire season, just getting volume, um, which in a points league is a pretty decent place to be, and volume on Edmonton, which obviously turned things around in November and had a pretty stellar rest of the season. So it was a good pickup. Um, yeah, pretty good pickup at that point. My worst drops, I dropped Jordan Bennington twice. And um, by the same virtue that Stuart Skinner was a good pickup, uh, Bennington was a pretty bad drop because he just had volume all season long, was actually pretty good with it. Um, so yeah, I probably could have just ridden Skinner and Bennington as pickups uh, for the entire season and never thought about my goaltenders ever again. And that probably would have been the best thing that I could have done with my goaltending situation in this league in particular. Um, 
I did drop Matt Duchesne on November 12th. And then, like I said, I put in a $16 waiver on him on December 4th when somebody else who had picked him up dropped him. And then I held on to him after that, thankfully. Uh, but I did drop Nazem Kadri. I did pick Nazem Kadri, actually 156th overall, so pretty late. Uh, I dropped him on December 6th. Uh, I don't remember the particulars, but I'm assuming he was in a bit of a cold stretch at that point. But he definitely heated up after that fact and had a pretty solid season overall. So definitely regretting that. That one. Um, in terms of trades, uh, I traded a few th different times here. So kind of the reverse of last season's situation when it became apparent to me that, you know, I wasn't really going to be able to contend with the top teams in this league in particular. Blake had a really good team and Reese's Pieces had a really good team. Um, they were just far and above the best teams in terms of points for, and I didn't really feel like I was going to have a uh, a really strong chance to compete with those those two teams even if I did make the playoffs and so I decided to kind of start trading away my assets and just look towards the future so I traded Mika Zibanejad and around 14 pick to Blake for Thomas Hurdle and around 15 pick and I traded Brad Marchand and around 17 pick to Reese's Pieces for Pareko and around 6 pick and then I traded Brock Besser and Brandon Montour plus my round 11 and 12 picks to Mark Barber at 18, at 18 skaters uh, for Riley Smith, Aaron Eckblad, and then his round 6 and round 7 picks next year. So yeah, in the end, traded away Zabanajad, Marshawn, Besser, and Montour and picked up an extra round five pick for next year, two extra round six picks for next year, and an extra round seven pick uh, while trading away round 11, 12, 14, and 17 picks, so later picks. Uh, basically just moving my picks up a lot. I should have a pretty strong complement of picks overall to work with for next year, and hopefully I can kind of stack up my lineup pretty well for next year with those picks. So, um yeah, I've said this before, but I do think this is kind of the optimal way to play it in a keeper league like this. I do think that the best way, um, if if you ever in a keeper league kind of have this situation where you feel like you're falling out of it and you're not going to be there um, at the end of it all, which was my situation in this league, I just think that probably the best thing to do is to trade away and get picks for next year if you can. If you got an active league like this one is, then you should be able to do so. Uh, so that's what I did. Uh, Blake will tell you his side of the... Uh, of the Zabana Jad uh, hurdle round five, round 14 swap uh, when we get to his portion on his team for the Experts League. But yeah, that's how this season went for me in the Experts League. Uh, we have welcomed Blake back to the program. Blake, you want to let the people know what's going on on your end? Are you, are you in any danger at this point? No, but buddy, this stinks. I, oh God. <laughs> I mean, bad internet is like the worst first world problem. Is <laughs> like, it's the first world problem. It's like my internet connection stinks. Like, oh, poor me, but it does suck. It's annoying. I mean, what the hell? Like, oh, this <laughs> took me like 15 minutes. Anywho. Um, yeah, it's nice to be here. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's, let's carry on. Um, hopefully you've been, uh, you know, just uh, singing my praises about uh, the experts league there. Have, have you, Nate? Is that what's, what's uh, I did mention that your team had a had a pretty good record in the experts league. So I'm sure you'll gloat plenty enough uh, when it comes to your turn. So I'll, I'll save the rest for that point. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, so next league that I want to touch on here, Kakuffle. So this is tier three in Kakuffle, the Binghamton division. This is a 14 team league head to head points. Um, in terms of anybody you might know, if you're listening to this, Shams from Short Shifts from the Keeping Carlson feed, he was in this league, so uh, you might know him if you listen to a bunch of fantasy hockey pods. Uh, in this league, I did win the championship. I was third in regular season points four, finished second with a bye in that league in terms of the overall standings. Uh, in the draft, my best picks, uh, Kiel McCarr at 13, I thought uh, ended up being a really, really good pick. If you look at Kakuffle points per game, he was uh, like 0.25 points per game above Roman Yossi, who is the next highest, uh, which is a pretty significant difference overall. And then Roman Yossi was like 0.4 points above the next player. So Yossi and Makar were a clear tier up and Makar was almost a tier up on Yossi. So I felt really good about Makar at 13. I think he was well worth that price um, in this draft. 
I got Travis Konechny at 83 in this draft. I got Brock Nelson at 114, and I got Brian Rust at 170 in this draft, and all those guys played pretty well for me. My worst picks, I took Tage Thompson at uh, 16 in this draft. That obviously didn't work out too well until the playoffs when he absolutely went off and helped me win. <laughs> so uh, it was terrible until it wasn't, I guess. I uh, had to make it without him basically all season long, but once I made it, it was pretty sweet. Uh, so that was my experience uh, with the Tage Thompson ride in this league. Uh, Chris Letang at 86. I don't think this was a terrible pick if you look at where he finished in terms of uh, the end of season ranks and the points per game. He actually finished pretty well, uh, but there's probably better uses I could have made of a seventh round pick in this league. So um, yeah, I'll put in Latang there. Overall though, like uh, I really think that this draft was just kind of solid uh, top to bottom. I didn't, you know, step outside and make any wild, uh, wild takes and uh, pretty much all of my top end picks hit to some extent, aside from Tage Thompson, who's obviously the biggest disappointment. But, you know, I had Stamkos, I had Fiala, I had Boldy, uh, Konechny, as I mentioned, Latang was still halfway decent. Um, yeah, I took Brandon Montour in the eighth round, 111th overall. Uh, that was probably fine in the end. It wasn't great. Um, maybe it was a little bit high for where he ranked end of season, but I think it was fine. Uh, basically, I I just didn't shoot myself in the foot with this draft. So um, that's a that's a very underrated part of drafting, in my opinion, is uh, avoiding mistakes, especially in the top I don't know five to seven rounds. If you can avoid major mistakes in those rounds, you're probably going to be there when all is tallied up at the end of the season. So I uh, felt like I was able to do that pretty well with this draft, with the biggest exception being Tage Thompson. My best ads, uh, I put in a $1 waiver claim on Logan Thompson right before week 24, which was the week where he started like all the games and like absolutely went off. He had a shutout in there. Um, and two other managers put in waiver claims for him, but $0 waiver claims. So I got Logan Thompson. I got all those points. Uh, so that was pretty stellar. My, Matthias Eckholm I picked up February 23rd in this league. Uh, Shane Pinto I picked up February 12th. And I actually wanted to make the point that I still count Pinto as one of the better ads that I made this year because um, it was part of the process, right? The underlings were looking really good when he came back. He was getting good uh, deployment at the time as well. And I really think that one of the things that I want to stress is that a really good ad is a player who's playing well at the moment that you can foresee being a part of your lineup for the next little while, has a good schedule moving forward. You pick them up and then you don't get attached to them. You let them play out the string and when they start to trend south again. You let them go, which is exactly what I did with Shane Pinto. I don't know if you had any similar experiences on your teams uh, with anything, Blake, but that was one that I really wanted to drive home. As I was looking through this, I was like, yeah, there are some of these guys that they didn't last on my team, but they were really valuable to me when I did pick them up. And it was important to my team's overall success that I had these moments throughout the season. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like playing with the house's money right? I mean, it's just a great way to think of it. It's like you didn't lose anything by picking up Shane Pinto. And um, you said something um, last season in one of your episodes, like um, I think it was, yeah, takeaways. And it's it's one of the things is like splitting the season up in segments, right? That's really important. Yeah. So yeah, you get Shane Pinto in there when he's flying. And then when once he stops, like you got him for nothing. So kick him to the curb and don't even think about it again. So um, I really like that. Yeah. Um, a couple more that I'll throw in there. You know, I had a $21 waiver that I got Alexis Lafreniere on January 2nd for. Ended up holding him for the rest of the season. He obviously had a huge playoffs as well. Um, good schedule. Everything worked out really well with Lafreniere. Joey Decord, again, similar story. Picked him up December 14th. He was terrific for a couple months and then kicked him to the curb when he started to decline when Grubauer came back and started taking away his starts. Um, so, yeah, didn't feel like there was any skin off my back, but he was terrific for a, a good stretch of the season. A big part of my team for that uh, that stretch. I put a $7 waiver claim on Ingram, Connor Ingram, November 20th. Again, similar story for two, three months. Connor Ingram was a big part of my team. He played terrific. And then when he started splitting again with Vegemelka and started his play started slipping, again, just kicked, kicked him to the curb. Didn't feel bad about it. Uh, that is 0G. And then Quentin Byfield, November 5th, uh, 
I did end up dropping Quentin Byfield, I believe, uh, in the playoffs. Uh, but he was a decent part of my team. And in a 14-team league, to find somebody on the waiver wires on November 5th who lasts on your team the whole year pretty much is actually a pretty big deal. So I threw that one in there. My worst drops, uh, there were a few. So, yeah, I, that's another thing I think that I want to uh, kind of drive home here with some of these is, like, even on these teams where I did win, like, it doesn't mean that every decision I made all season long was perfect. I feel like a lot of people beat themselves up. Um, they have a bad stretch. They lose three matchups in a row, and they're like, there's no way I can climb out of this. I've made too many mistakes. Like, I'm terrible at this. Like, that's not the case. Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, I make mistakes even in the leagues that I won this year. I definitely made a lot of mistakes. I could have played better. I could have, you know, um, maybe foreseen things differently. In some cases, like, I don't think I made a wrong decision, like, by the process. Uh, it just turned out that the players, you know, immediately got promoted to a different line or something along those lines. So um, I dropped Bertuzzi, uh, Todd Bertuzzi, not Todd Bertuzzi, Tyler Bertuzzi. I did it again. Uh, Tyler Bertuzzi. You should have kept eight. him, Nate. Come on. Yeah, that was right before the Max Domi, Tyler Bertuzzi, Austin Matthews line got created, and they absolutely blew up. Um, I dropped Arturi Lekkanen January 29th. He popped off on the top line shortly thereafter, but uh, he had a two-game week that week. I, I distinctly remember uh, kind of thinking to myself, what am I missing or gaining here with Lekkanen? I honestly don't know how I feel about that one still. How do you feel about that, Blake? Like, I dropped him because it was a two-game week. Um even if I had kept him, like I would have kept him for probably, I think it was like a, a pretty solid stretch, maybe three weeks to a month where he was uh, getting some pretty good deployment. And then he got booted down again. And then I feel like a lot of people hung on to him too long when he was actively hurting their lineups. So mm -hmm. how do you feel about that kind of move where, um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, he dropped Lekin and he went off. That was a terrible drop. But in, in the aggregate, like, was it the wrong move to drop him for a two game week back then? You won. You won the <laughs> championship. So hell no, buddy. I mean, yeah, like could have, would have, should have for sure. Right. And <laughs> and there are going to be so many decisions like that, that we make throughout the year. And the, the thing that we try and do here at apples and Genos is just put things on your side, right? Give you, so yeah. you can make informed decisions. And that decision made absolute sense. I'm sure to you when you did it, even though you did listen to me, all right, that you should <laughs> keep Lekin in on your team. All right. Because he popped off. Um, I'm still really big on that player. I love Lecky, but uh, yeah, I mean, it made total sense and you won. So proof is in the pudding folks. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Lindgren I dropped on December 17th uh, shortly thereafter he kind of took over as the true starter in Washington and actually got a lot of volume and was pretty valuable for fantasy purposes um, Noah Hannafin I had early on I dropped him November 2nd so I barely had him on the team uh, he ended up having a pretty solid fantasy season overall the Flames started to feature him on the top power play to try to get the trade done which they eventually did um, so yeah I don't know how I feel about that one Hannafin has always kind of been a more interchangeable part, but he ended up having a pretty solid season this year. I Similarly, I had Brock Faber on my team for a short stint, uh, literally dropped him before November started, so he wasn't doing anything at that point, but obviously it would have been nice to have Faber for his big stretch uh, where he was absolutely one of the hottest defensemen in the league for a solid month or so. So that's uh, my worst drops from the team. Um, yeah, just another note, actually, on on Lindgren. Like, uh, a lot of people are like, uh, you got to hit on all the perfect goaltenders for Zero G to work. Like, I did not hit on all the perfect goaltenders. Like, even the guys that I did hit on, Ingram and Decor, uh, throughout the season, I dropped them before the finals. Like, they didn't win me my league. Uh, those weren't the guys that brought me to the finish line. It was Logan Thompson uh, in the last uh, week that I picked up. Uh, uh, that was really a, a big part of it. And then it was just volume guys uh, after that. So, yeah, I dropped Lindgren on December 17th. Like, I missed on that one. Uh, you really don't have to bat a 1,000 to, to to really get ahead with 0G. And I think that's a misnomer that a lot of people um, put out there is that you actually have to be really good at, at picking goaltenders for this to work. And I really don't think that's the case. I don't think that uh, there's some, like, secret sauce to this um, that's making it work. I think you just have to be attentive and be on situations that might work out. And if they continue to work out, you continue to roster the goaltender. And that's really all it is. Um, 
And then just trades. I did make one trade in this league. I traded Kevin Fiala and Braden McNabb for Alex Ovechkin and Cam York on December 17th. Overall, I think that actually ended up being a net negative uh, to, to me. Fiala actually had a pretty good back end of the season, and Ovechkin did have a really hot stretch at the end, uh, which helped me in the playoff run uh, for sure. But up until that point, he was not super hot. So I think Fiala, in terms of total points, uh, did outplay him. Uh, Ovechkin's uh, schedule, though, I will say, in the fantasy playoffs was pretty helpful. So that part did uh, did help me out. So overall, I think maybe I'd call it a wash. Uh, however you want to look at that is fine, I guess, in the end. But um, yeah, interesting trade uh, to look back on for sure. All right, I'm going to keep rolling through here. The Fantasy Puck Content Creators League. This is a 12-team head-to-head points league. Uh, we had two guys from Fantasy Puck in there. Josh was in there. Jared from Fired Up Fantasy. Fantasy Tipped was in there. Ian Gooding's in there. Data Draft. Uh, Victor Nuno's in there. Chris Wassel's in there. So lots of people that you probably know if you're tuned in to Fantasy Hockey. And I won the championship in this league as well. Finished first in the league in the uh, standings. Second in points four. In the draft, my best picks, I picked JT Miller at 23. He ended up finishing top 10 in this league. Uh, Jake Gensel at 47. I picked Phil Forsberg at 95. Uh, Mike Matheson at 119. All really good picks there. My worst picks, uh, Dougie Hamilton at 26, obviously, with the injury, but he had already lost the top power play to Luke Hughes, so that was trending poorly already. And Chris Letang at uh, 71 probably could have done a little better there it wasn't it didn't sink me by any stretch but probably could have done better with that pick overall um in terms of the ads here uh i added alexis lafreniere right before playoffs uh actually in the playoffs march 30th uh, with an extra ad from the prior week so that was really key for my final week uh, in this league I picked up Charlie Lindgren, March 11th. I picked up Frederick Anderson, actually, March 10th. Um, a lot of people think that's kind of crazy, but uh, Carolina did have a bunch of three-game schedules, and they are very clearly just alternating Kachikov and Anderson, so it didn't make sense for people in the playoffs to be rostering Anderson if he was only going to get them the one game played. And so it made sense that he was out there, and again, this is the power of having a buy. Uh, if you have a buy, you can be the person who has the first access when somebody drops a, a goaltender on a good team like like this and you can get in there and you can grab them up uh, or any player really it doesn't have to be a goaltender uh, Gabe Velarde I picked up February 19th uh, Joey Decord in this league as well back on December 18th uh, played a, a few good months for me before I dropped him Worst drops, uh, Tyler Bertuzzi shows up again March 11th. I dropped him. Luke Hughes I had in this league and dropped February 14th, and he closed out the season really strong after that. Uh, Matthias Eckholm I dropped back on January 22nd. It took maybe a month or so after that, but he did obviously have a really hot end to the season. I mean, I had Uko Pekalukanen back uh, in November, dropped him November 20th. It took a while for him to get going to, but obviously he was a great 0G uh, goaltender in the kind of second half of the season uh in this one i had nikolai ehlers november 3rd i dropped him uh early on in the season he was getting absolutely no minutes uh, it was a big deal i uh, really didn't start to get any minutes until velarde got injured actually and so i've talked about this before but I kind of feel like even though Ehlers ended up having a great season overall, like it would, he was definitely like an above uh, replacement level player. Like mm-hmm. I think people would say that on the season, you're happy to have rostered him. I don't know that I feel like it was a terrible move to drop him at the time. Um, you know, if the Velarde injury hadn't happened, how long would it have taken him to really get more minutes or to get the kind of scoring going that he eventually did? I don't know. Um, yeah, altogether, I don't know that it was it was a terrible move. And I've talked about too, like while you're waiting for somebody to pop off, there's a there's like a sunk cost fallacy there, right? Like I can't drop this guy because I know he's good and I know it's gonna happen, but if it doesn't happen for a month, you've wasted a month of having a yep. negative player on your team when you could have been rostering somebody who's helping who's helping you and maybe you know, adding a guy who sticks on your lineup for the whole year and ends up being a really key uh pickup. So I don't know if you got any thoughts on that, Blake, uh, if that's something you've seen as well, but there is something 
resistant to this, uh, even when it's a guy that we expect to turn around at some point, if they're not getting deployment, especially is where it's really hard to just keep banking that, you know, the coach is going to see it with this guy. He's going to see yeah. what we see in the stats and he's going to start playing them. Sometimes it just doesn't happen. Yeah. And, and there's situational awareness there too. Like it all depends where you are in your league, right? Like if you're, if you're popping off and you're first place or you're in the top third and you got Nikolai Ehlers, who's dinking around on your lineup, but you're loving the underlying metrics and you think there's a chance like, yeah, I definitely hold on to players like that. But, um, I have no problem too. Like when I, you know, and I'll get into it with some of my drops too, is like, okay, you're not playing. And I'm kind of in a, in a hunt for like the playoffs here, I need to win. Like you're gone. No problem. So yeah, it's kind of depends where you are in your league too. Yeah. All right. Last one for me, the Apples and Genos patron league. This is a 12 team head to head bangers cats league. Um, Josh was in this one as well. We have Craig from the fancy, uh, the five hole taxi squad. Sorry. And uh, Nimmer is in here as well. He's a tier one, a couple competitor went to the playoffs in tier one, uh, of Kakuffle this year. So he'll be back in tier one and I'll meet him there next year. Um, so definitely some, some names in this league as well. Uh, in this league, I did win the championship here as well. Fourth in the regular season uh, in this one. In the draft, my best picks, I had Jake Gensel in this one as well at 46. I picked Forsberg at 51. I picked Brian Rust at 147. And I picked Braden McNabb at 195. I really do think that one of the more underrated things to do in a bangers-cats league is to identify some key bangers defensemen late who are going to fill up those categories for you and just use those late picks that are basically dart throws anyway and just get some of these really elite level hits block specialists like a guy like brain McNabb is McNabb ended up staying on my team for most of the season and being a really key part of it uh, my worst picks Patrick Line I took at 75 I think we all know how his season went Jacob Chikrin at 94 ended up not being worth that that uh, level of draft capital and then Alexander Georgiev uh, yeah. in the 10th round at pick 118, uh, 897 save percentage. So I don't think he felt was like such a win. win. Hey, like, felt, oh, my God. Yeah, I felt like I couldn't pass him up there uh, in a Cats League like this. But, uh, yeah, I don't know that it was worth it uh, in the end. Uh, so, yeah, best ads. April uh, 1st, I picked up Alexis Lafreniere again. Uh, just for that last week, and he absolutely popped off. Matthias Ekholm, I picked up in this league March 24th. Uh, did have a terrific week there for me as well. Pavel Buchnevich, way back October 31st, he had a really, really slow start to the season, and he was dropped in this league, and I picked up Buchnevich then and carried him through the entire season, so that was a good one. Uh, my worst drops, uh, I dropped Nick Schmaltz on March 26th, and he promptly scored six points in his next three games, so that was pretty sweet. Uh, Would have obviously helped in in my uh, finals matchup there. And again, I had Tyler Bertuzzi and dropped him on March 10th in this league, and I had Wyatt Johnston in this league as well and dropped him January 22nd, like right oh before he absolutely took off. So that one doesn't feel good either. I didn't make any trades in this one either. I do want to go back to the goaltenders in this one. So I picked Georgiev in the 10th round, and I picked Andre Vasilevsky in the 12th. If you remember, there was a lot of uncertainty about his injury and when he would be back. Uh, there was some talk that it would be like three months before he'd be back. Ended up being a lot less than that, so it seemed like a big steal. Neither of these guys had really good seasons. Georgiev in particular had a pretty terrible season. He did get me a lot of wins, like... Uh, Colorado will definitely do that for you. And he did play a lot of games, so he uh, got me a lot of saves. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's just kind of ironic. And um, yeah, just uh, zero G, folks. Like, <laughs> what else am I going to say? Georgiev in the 10th, like, people were like, this is a clown league. You shouldn't be playing in this league. And what do we really know? Uh, he ended up having an 897 save percentage on one of the best teams in the entire league. So um, yeah, all that to say... Um, I just don't think you need to be hammering goaltenders. I do think that volume guys in cats leagues like this are pretty important. And so I'd be looking for a volume guy, but you can, you don't have to pay up for one of the top five goaltenders uh, to be getting a volume guy. You can definitely find other guys than just that. So um, yeah, that's my kind of takeaway. I don't know. Do you have any similar takes? What would, what do you think about these cats league goaltenders? And do you think like, if you if you're in my position, like if this happens to you next year, Blake, and you're staring down like a top five goaltender, and it's like the eighth, ninth, tenth round, are you feeling like you have to pull the trigger at that point? 
I mean, it always depends on who's around him as well. But I mean, going into this season, Georgia at 118. I mean, I mean, that seems like a smash, right? Going in. And I think, yeah, that must have felt weird for you too. Cause you're like, oh, I, I, this is yeah. not normally what I do, but I mean, th- we know this team is going to be good. And um, yeah, it's, it's hard to predict what, what happened with Georgia this season. Right. Um, so I think like, and I'll talk a little bit about it in mine as well, but yeah, cats leagues and goalies. I think there's something there that it's, it's like a little adaptation to zero G that we need to sort of identify. And like, it doesn't mean you draft them sooner, but it's a certain type of goal you may be looking for. Right. That's going to help you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely a topic we can dive into this offseason for sure. So major takeaways for me, um, just just two really. Uh, zero G without exception is going to be the first one. Like, um, I don't, I'll I'll spoil it right here on the air. I'm going into Kakuffle Tier One next year. I'm going to be doing an auction draft. Um, I'm going to take two goaltenders. Most likely I'm going to spend a total of two auction dollars on those two goaltenders. Yeah, like, love I, that. I, I just don't see the value. I, I look across all these leagues. Like I did hold Georgiev all year. It's debatable whether I even should have, to be mm. quite honest with you. I did hold Vasilevsky all year. Again, there were stretches where he was actively hurting my team. Um, where I wished that I could drop him, but I felt like yeah. I couldn't. And that's exactly what I tell people not to do with goaltenders, right? Don't put yourself in these situations. If I go across all my other teams, like here, I'll, I'll read out the other goaltenders that I drafted. I've drafted Philip Grubauer and Eunice Corposalo, uh in the Fantasy Puck League, dropped both of them. I drafted Philip Grubauer and Logan Thompson in Kukupful, and I dropped both of them. Uh, and in the uh, Experts League, I drafted Devin Levi and Vili Huso and pretty clearly dropped both of them. So why am I spending anything on these goaltenders if I know that I'm just going to drop them anyway? Like, why don't I take the lowest common denominator and just start um, just start going after whoever's, whoever's out there as soon as waivers open, whoever's getting starts, whoever's the first upstart goaltender? Um, yeah, I just don't feel beholden to goaltenders uh, whatsoever. So, zero G to the end, uh, it's the way to go. Um, yeah, I I think I'm 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 like even more zero G now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after this season than I was coming into the season, um, at least in the way that most people view it. Like, I don't think my general uh, perception has really changed, but like. Um, yeah, just looking back, like there's, there's so little reason, like in, aside from like, you know, week one, like the starting day, having a starting goaltender on, on opening day. So, you know, you're going to get like three starts that opening week, like maybe yeah. that's of some value to you. But aside from that, like, I just don't feel like I have to be taking goaltenders, um, early whatsoever. I know I'm not the first to have faded goaltenders in leagues. I say that constantly on this podcast people always want to call me out and say you're not the first to fade goaltenders i'm well aware uh i gave it a name and i've developed a lot of strategy around how to proceed with goaltenders both in the draft and throughout the season that's what zero g is to me it's not just fading goaltenders it's uh it's a whole uh, system and strategy around how to proceed at the goaltender position but uh yeah if anything this season has definitely redoubled my my uh, intent as far as next season goes. Um, And one other thing I do want to say here is across all of my leagues, I made the most moves of every, of anyone in every single one of my leagues. Um, There was uh, one or two, I forget exactly where I was tied with someone else, but I used every single ad in every single league all year. In yeah, basically across the board. And I do think that that's absolutely paramount. Uh, I, think there's so few situations in which uh, not using an ad is the optimal solution like that's a probably like a 0.1 percent occurrence so absolutely use every single move all the time everything everywhere all at once uh, when it comes to <laughs> making the most of your moves great movie you got anything to add there uh like yeah, it's just uh, this is interesting to hear you talk about, um, especially those goalies, because that's like a zero G case study for you, right? Because normally you would never have a goalie that has that name, right? And that's one of those things, like you had George Evan Vasilevsky. That's one of those things about zero G that you just avoid because you yeah. don't have those guys. And then that 
that feeling like you have to keep them because of the potential of what they're going to do, right? You can get that out of your mind and just focus on what they actually are doing and be like, no, get the hell out of here, right? And then, like you said, you don't have to smash it. You can you can drop a guy, pick up another guy, just, it, um, but I, I love that you're doubling down and I'm doubling down too, buddy. Like I had a very interesting year this year with zero G and I'll get into that, but um, I'm with you, man. It's the way, there's no doubt in my mind. All right, Blake. Why don't you take us in and tell us about your teams? All right, let's do the thing. So, yeah, I played in two of two of the leagues that Nate already talked about, so that's going to be helpful. Um, I, I do want to talk about my Cupful team. Um, just overall, I played five head-to-head -head leagues, two points leagues, uh, all on Yahoo. Then I played two dynasty leagues on Fantrax as well. Plus, I had a little like a, a bunch of best ball leagues and some other little things like that, right? That I'm not really talking on here, but my main focuses were. Uh, my Yahoo leagues, my my head to head leagues. That's what I was doing. So, anyways, I'm going to talk about my couple team. I'm going to talk about the experts league, and I'm going to talk about the A and G listener league as well. So let's get the biz. We got to get in there. Um, so I'll start with my couple team. I was in tier seven. This is my second year playing couple. I didn't make the playoffs last year. Uh, I placed ninth in my division, um, but I I led the division in points. And history has repeated itself, folks. I did make the playoffs again this year. I was in tier seven. I moved up because of my point total, I believe. Um, my record was 10 and 12, which is good. But I, I took a lot of bad beats. Um, I looked into some of my losses. Like the, I, was, I would have a good week. It's just my opponent would have a better week. So there's some things that were out of my control there. And four of those losses, um, like a couple losses, they were under 10 points. And mm. two of those were under four. So. Ouch. That's brutal. You know, that's like, you know, we're literally talking like a couple shots, a block, like whatever, you know, like getting really granular with it. So that that's really hard to take. Um, but anyways, yeah, like a couple, as Nate said, it's a 14 team head to head points league. 14 teamer is an interesting uh, thing there. I, I do like playing these 14 teamers and 16 teamers because yeah, you're just stretched so thin and your strategy becomes even more important, right? And the waiver wire becomes even more important. So the, there's a nice element of strategy there. That said, I didn't make the damn playoffs. My God. Um, anyways, I finished seventh, um, but again, second in the regular season in points four in my couple division and really close to first. So that's fine. Um, let's talk about my draft here. I, I felt great about my draft after a couple, like I felt really, really good. I remember sending you and Josh and Banksy like pictures of my team and you guys were like, yeah, wow, that's, that's pretty nice. Like you got so-and-so at this pick and so-and-so at this pick. It's like, yeah, I did. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, look where it got me. But anyways, um, <laughs> so some of my best picks here, I picked the Sex Panther, Sam Reinhardt. I basically got him everywhere, which was awesome. But uh, I certainly didn't predict that he was going to, you know, get 55 goals and, you know, just pop off the way he is. I had him for like a point per game. But anyways, I got him at 79. He finished 11th overall in a couple scoring. So that's a massive dub. I did pick up uh, Valerie Nichushkin, Machine Gun Valley. I got him at 90th, uh, you know, and before he got injured, he was popping the hell off. Like this guy was, was red hot. He did finish at 156, but that's not indicative of, of what he was doing as a player. So I, I think that pick was really good. I picked Brock Besser at 191. He finished at 51. Good God. Thank you, Brock, for your service. I called him a 30 and 30 guy this year. No, how about a 40 and 30 guy? I love that. <laughs> thank you, Brock. And then I got Drake Batherson uh, where that was a, a pick that, Nate didn't like of his because he got him a little earlier. I got him at 107, which, uh, you know, that's, that's not too, that's not too shabby for me. He had a nice little end to the year. Um, so I did like that pick at, at that value there. Um, for me, my worst picks of this draft, I picked, uh, I had picked nine and I picked J Rob, Jason Robertson. And I thought I was being safe. I thought that was a nice safe pick. What, you know, with some upside because of what Robertson was able to do last season with his metrics, um, with the Dallas power play and how they were going off. And it didn't really materialize. Like I picked him at nine. He finished at 30 in a couple scoring. So it's still a valuable piece. But when you pick a guy in the first round, you want him to finish around the first round, right? Yeah. Like we're dropping down two rounds there with my first pick. And that's, that's just not a good place to be in my opinion. Right. And I don't know. It's going to Jason Robertson next season is going to be interesting because Dallas has such balanced scoring and you got a guy like Wyatt Johnston coming up here who's going to, you know, maybe take some touches away. I don't know if he gets on that top line, maybe, maybe bumps Pavelski out of there. I don't know. Um, that would be great for Wyatt Johnston and probably for Robertson too, but I could see a better season for Robertson next season, but who knows? We'll have to see 
what's what. I also picked up um, the cat, Alex Debrinkit, at 34. And I, I at the beginning of the season, the first third of the season, I was like, this is a slam dunk. Look yeah. at me, everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah, Alex Debrinkit. But, I, you know, he was a constant guy on my sell high show because of mm -hmm. he was redlining in every single metric. It didn't make sense. And yeah, eventually the wheels did fall off and he finished at 70. So it's not terrible, but you know, I didn't get the value. Like, uh, you know, my third overall pick, there was probably a lot better uh, players that I could have got there that would have given me some, you know, some reasonable production there. So, and then I did pick uh, Yakov Verana. You and I were both on Verana this season. I, I thought there was a legit, opportunity for him to get in the top six and top power play there in St. Louis. And, you know, it's just something with the player. I think like he he's, this has happened at every stage of his career or every professional team that he's played with. He's kind of getting this treatment. So I, I don't know. That's a guy that I, I'm, is basically I'm hands off until I see some, some real consistency there, but he, he's a good metrics guy. Anywho. Um, yeah. So I, but I really liked my draft. I thought it was really good. Yeah. I mean, the lat, like, you know, my goalies, I picked Jacob Markstrom at 146. I picked Elvis Merzlikens at 219. So I went zero G here. Um, mm -hmm. Markstrom, I kept all year. Merzlikens, I ended up dropping and I picked up a bunch of other guys. Um, so let's talk about my ads. I, uh, I, I think I made some good ones again. Um, you know, you, you and I were both on Matias Ekholm this season and he, he just had a great one, right? So mm -hmm. I added him and kept him for the rest of the season on December 4th and he finished 135th, um, in, in a couple scoring. So that's great. Uh, Blake, the snake Coleman. Yo, I got him December 11th, held him for most of the season. That guy finished 77th. Right. And I had him right through the, that, se uh, section of the season where he was like popping the hell off. Um, so, you know, I got a lot of love for Blake Coleman. He helped me a lot in that kind of that middle section of, of my season here. Um, I did get Joey Decord. I had him December 18th and I held him for most of the season, but yeah, I did. He became expendable to me well before, um, you know, Grubauer came back. I think I had some other plans and, and got some other guys in there, but he definitely solidified that position for me. And I did get that run for Joey Decord with my good couple teams. So I like that. Um, what else? Luke Hughes, I picked up December 29th. He was pissing me off all season, doing just enough to stay on my team. But, uh, <laughs> you know, he I held him rest of the season. He finished 237th. Like, you know, he's a power play one quarterback and a 14-teamer. That yeah. makes absolute sense. You get that guy on your team and you just live with the production. So that's where I was at with that. Um, worst drops. Um, yeah, I mean, I drafted Owen Tippett in this league. I drafted him 135th and I dropped him like he was lukewarm. What up? There's no respect <laughs> for this shot monster, this beefer. I dropped him early, October 13th. I was like, no, because I think it was after the first week, Torts was giving him the Torts treatment. Like, oh, here's yep. 12 minutes, Owen Tippett. I'm like, I'm not here for this. So get the hell off, off my team. I, you know, I can figure something out here. But obviously, that's not the way that it ended. Like, um, Owen Tippett finished 55th in kick couple scoring. Yeah. So that's that's not great uh, for me. Gus Nyquist, I had um, a couple times during the year, but I ended up dropping him finally on November 30th. Um, and someone else picked him up. He finished 80th. So that that's a bit of an L there. And I had Connor Ingram on my team prior to him sort of popping off with all those shutouts and that great stretch of play. I really could have used that, right? Um, he finished 200th, but that doesn't really tell the story about what Ingram was actually able to do. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it is what it is, right? I feel I'm, I'm right in line with a lot of the stuff that you said there, Nate, just about kind of cutting it in, in sections here. And yeah, you just, you just do the best you can for each segment and you don't worry about it. Like I talked to so many fantasy managers, like in the DMS or whatever else. And they're just, they're so choked. Like, Oh, I dropped this guy. I should have picked up this guy. It's like, who cares? Like, what are you doing next? Like, let's focus on what we're doing now and like, let's get, get going here. Right. Cause we, yeah. we can't really look back. I mean, it would be a nice exercise and probably painful actually I'd be like, Oh God, no, I like, I could have <laughs> won. I could have been in the playoffs, but uh, yeah, forget that. All right. Let's, let's move forward. But anyways, um, trades, this is something that you and I are, are pretty different at because uh, I'm a big trade guy. I like mm -hmm. trying to not fleece other managers, but to find value. That's why I do the buy low, sell high show and cream of the crop is because I feel like I have a good finger on the pulse there. Um, we, we both do, I think. Uh, and Josh as well. Like I want buy lows on my team when I feel like they're going to start popping off. And I made some good ones. I made the only two trades in our division and they were both pretty, pretty monstrous. Um, first one I made on December 21st, I traded Brock Besser and Jason Robertson for Kirill, the thrill Kaprasov and Carter swaggy Verhage. Um, so to me, that's a big dub. I think that's a net positive yeah. at this point, like risky bisky for sure, but it worked out. 
Um, Cap at the time was underachieving massively. Mm -hmm. um, so was Matt Boldy, right? The whole Minnesota team. But we know what Cap's done here. Like he, he's, he did Cap things. Like he's back on the point pace that we sort of predicted, Nate. So um, yeah. that's one thing that's really neat. When, when Nate and I go through our projections and stuff, we're going to do an episode on that. Like there was a lot of guys I wasn't feeling good about, but you know, even just this last like month of the season, they're starting to pop off and get those numbers back up to where I feel good about it. And cap mm -hmm. is one of those guys. Like, I think he's on like a 97 point pace or something like that. We, I had him for 104. You had him for over hundred. I think like this yeah. guy's a beauty. I love uh Kirill Kaprasov. And then Carter Verhage, he finished, uh, where cap finished at eight. Um, whereas, uh, Jason Robertson finished at 30th, like I said, so that's a win for me. Verhage finished at 52, Brock finished at 51. Verhage would have beat Brock Besser if he would have been healthy for the end of the season. There's no mm -hmm. question there. So yeah, that's a win for me, I think. So yeah, that's, I feel good about that. Um, what, am, what else I got to say? Um, the other trade I made was John Tavares for Tage Thompson. I was in on Tage too. And, uh, you know, when I traded Tavares, um, it was before he was a buy low. It was while he was still like popping off with his metrics and, and kind of chipping away with point per game pace. And then he sort of went cold. Like right after I traded him, he went real cold. And Tage was just cold. He just stayed cold for a long, long periods, except for the playoffs, which he popped off, which I wasn't in. So, but he did help me to a cool seventh place finish. Uh, thank you, Tage, for your service. Oh, God, Tage, what are you doing? I'm all over this player next season, though, by the way. I know. How are you feeling about Tage next season? I know we've talked a little bit about this player. Yeah, I'll be really interested to see how the fantasy hockey community uh, values Tage Thompson, because uh, I really do think that he's got all the like um infinitely high ceiling basically as as a talent. It's really going to come down to what the price to acquire is, because yeah, like if people are just box score scouting and they're looking at a guy who's got fifty six points in seventy games, and they're like, I'm not going to buy on that guy until the sixth round mm -hmm. then oh yeah by all means get me in there get me in there in the fourth round i think um for sure and probably sooner like yeah i i, I mean it's it's so hard to find that kind of league altering upside that i think it's a swing that i want to make i just spent a, a bunch of time talking about how i don't want to make mistakes in the early part of my draft um but i, I just feel like this is like maybe maybe last year was about as good as the season could have gone for Tage, but maybe this year is literally as bad as it could have gone for him. And so even if it's somewhere in the middle, I just think that uh, there's a lot of skin left on the bone here. And I would be pretty shocked personally if he wasn't at least somewhere in like the 75 to 80 point range again next year. Um, yeah, I'll get into it more once I am able to dig in on projections and, and get through all that and see what, obviously, if the Sabres do something this offseason, Paterka coming up and being a big yeah. time producer over the back end, that feels good as somebody who can help raise Thompson's floor if he has somebody to work with. Um, yeah, I, I just think in the end, I'm going to be in on a player who I think has all the talent in the world, whose metrics have been otherworldly at times. We got to get this man some minutes. I mean... Yeah. Mr. Granado, please. I mean, geez, I've written you letters. I've emailed you. No response whatsoever. Very rude. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's fine. Um, but, yeah, 20-minute Tage. Imagine if that happened. I mean, just yeah. imagine. Just imagine, folks. For Tage in the fourth round. Yes, please. Oh, my God. Um, so I'm into Tage next season. Anyways, I like that trade. I I, I was making a trade for a schedule kind of play. And, uh, yeah, it, it would have worked out, I think. But did get a chance. That's fine. Um, so big takeaways in this league, like, you know, first off, I was first overall in moves, uh, just as you said, Nate, like I I'm like you, I think you've got a stream. Like there's no reason you should be leaving moves on the table. You can always do something. So, yep. um, yeah, you just gotta be thinking ahead. If you're, you got a move left on Sunday and you don't need it for your matchup, you, you use it for the next week and you, and you do that. Right. So, uh, my thing up about a couple though, which I, I know is not a weakness of mine, but just an area that needs to be shored up is like, my streaming. I think that, especially in Kakuffle, I felt like I was battling in a lot of matches. Like I'd, I'd set my lines, my active players, and then I'd see a games played mismatch. Like they'd have more games played to me and I'd get like concerned about that. So sometimes on the Monday morning, I would make like three moves. So three of my four moves, I would make good pickups, but like, you know, you're really handcuffing yourself a little bit. You're not like, I, and I felt that in a few matchups where I was like, 
man, I wish I had a couple more moves because things happen throughout the week. You know, yeah. you need to be able to pivot. And I think the adjustment I'm going to make moving forward next year is just, just slow roll a little bit, like two moves maximum on Monday, really, unless you're, you know, really battling or there's like must add players that you got to get on your team. And maybe you can take an L in a week. Like, but I think just as an overall strategy, I think I'm going to be looking at doing maybe two moves maximum because yeah, I found myself maxed out of four moves and it's already Saturday and it's, you just have no control. Right. And then yeah. whatever happened, whatever the other guy does, like picks up a hot goal or someone gets injured, he picks him up. And then that's your, like, like I said, I had a lot of close losses and maybe if I had some moves, I would have been able to absorb those points and do a little bit better. Right. So yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that, Nate? Yeah, I think it's a good point. I don't know that I've ever really, you know, like, um, consciously define this for myself, but I can probably count on one hand the number of times that I made three moves on a Monday yeah. uh, across my four leagues this entire season. So um, it's definitely not something I'm trying to do. I do like it. It If I'm looking at my lineup and thinking that I need to make three moves, I'm looking really hard and thinking about whether I really need to make those moves or if it's something that I can stomach or, um, you know, maybe hold this guy. He's got a game on Tuesday, but I can hold him past then. And then maybe I'll drop him after that game and add somebody for Wednesday and beyond. Um, yeah, you just, there's so much that happens, you know, especially if your league yeah. has some decent flexibility with IR spots and somebody's going to get injured. Somebody's going to get moved around. You can move somebody around. Sometimes, sometimes players get moved around, uh, uh, IR plus on and off IR plus and actually works out really well in your favor. Sometimes yeah. a guy who's only going to play two games that week um, gets moved on to IR plus or gets moved on to IR plus after his first game of the week, he doesn't play for three days. Um, and so you can actually, if you have the ads available to you, you can actually pick up somebody who's got a back to back and you can sneak an extra two games midweek. And it actually ends up being a really big uh, boon for your team on the overall week. But you can't do that if you're handcuffing yourself by using three ads ads on a Monday. And so it is something that I really try to avoid. One to two moves uh, every Monday is pretty much what I'm doing almost without question um, throughout every every Monday of the season, basically. So yeah, I definitely I definitely feel that. Not really something that I'd really, yeah, consciously uh, put out there or probably even talked about on the podcast, but definitely mm -hmm. something that I am doing for myself. Yeah. And it's just a good point. And to me, it's just a little adjustment. Like it wasn't every week, but the weeks where I did that, those are, those were hard weeks, right? They, they were yeah. really like, you're just, I don't like feeling out of control and that's kind of what you're doing, right? You're, you're, yeah. you're, you're handing your control away. <laughs> so I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to do that next season. I'll be damned if I'm going to lose uh, a bunch of these matches by like four points. What the hell? <laughs> um, all right, let's move on. I'll talk about another league here. The experts league that Nate already mentioned. Um, that I was in with him and a bunch of other beauties. Um, it's keep three points league. Um, I finished second overall. Oh yeah. Oh God. It was terrible. All right. That was very soul crushing, but I'll get into that. Um, but I did have the best reg uh, regular season record. Shout out to me, low key brag at 17 and five. <laughs> All right. My team was a wagon. All right. It was amazing, but uh, you know, not good enough apparently. And I'll uh, let you know why. So um, this, this was a league that was already established. So you guys played it one year prior. Is that right, Nate? Yep. Yeah. So um, a team dropped out. I jumped on the team because I wanted to be in there because I'm an expert. All right. And <laughs> self-proclaimed. Okay. And uh, yeah, so um, I had to deal with the, the roster as is. Um, luckily there were some good keepers on there, uh, mainly dry Seidel. Leon dry Seidel. uncle Leon. Um, yeah, he was, hello, sorry, I'm losing, uh, losing myself. <laughs> um, but yeah, so dry settle was one of my keepers and there wasn't anyone else on the team that I was really, you know, loving. Um, th there was some kind of mid mid guys or just above mid. And I, I, I kind of went a different way. He, um, this team did have Adam Fox and Miro Heiskinen. And I knew like, I I'm kind of with you, Nate, like I'm, I think that defense should be prioritized a little bit like these top defenders. I think yeah. the, the value over replacement, that's a real thing. And I, I thought this was kind of the safest thing I could do. I could lock up two amazing defensemen that aren't going anywhere. Like Adam Fox and Miro Heiskanen, like Fox got another 70 point season. heiskey has got he's in the sixties, right? And he's starting to pop off too. So these are, these are great players. I felt really comfortable keeping those players. So I did that. Um, you know, and I finished second, right? I lost in the finals, but I did have the second uh, points for second best points for in this league as well. 
So let's take a look at the draft. I, I loved my draft in this one. I felt really good about it. Um, you know, so some of my best picks, I got uh, Philip Forsberg at 71. Nice. Damn, how the hell? Um, like this guy finished seventh overall in this scoring. So that was amazing for me. Um, that's a guy we were on top of, Nate. And I'm really happy about that. I'm really proud about that, that we were pushing that yeah. because people picked him up because of that. And obviously they got the, you know, they got this guy's career high season, career high goals. Like he's been smashing. So I don't know what that player is going to do next season. It'll be tough to match this, but this has been a great one for him. Um, I also got Johnny Marcheseau. I got him at 95. He finished 33rd. So that's a, that's a big win. And then how about Joel Erickson Eck? I got it. 122. <laughs> he finished the 29, 29th, and he was injured for like two weeks. This yep. guy was flying. So that was a very nice uh, draft pick. And that's not a guy that I'm normally on, right? Obviously, he's a great fantasy producer, but, you know, in category leagues more so than a points league. But he was just doing it all this year and got, you know, got bumped up to the top line at one point and the power play. He was just smashing. So I love that. Um, I also did get Aiden Hill at 194 and, you know, he finished at 435, but he was injured for a lot of the season. But before that, this this guy was solid. He was had some of the best metrics for a goalie. Right. And he really again, like when you're doing zero G, if you can get a guy in there, that gives you some. Uh, like solidifies that position a little bit, and even short term, like I, I held Aiden Hill all year. Um, and I felt fine with that. Obviously I put him in IR and was able to, to stream in some goalies here and there. But, um, to me, like that is major value at that draft position. It's insane. Um, I also picked Seth Jarvis. I had him, which was a really nice pick. Where did I get him? Oh God. Um, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Oh, this is great podcasting everybody. Yeah. Um, 143rd, I got Seth Jarvis. So that was, that was great. I mean, he, he smashed all year and that was a sleeper that we were looking at. But yeah, um, the problem with Jarvis is he was great, but I dropped him and I didn't get the value. Oh no. So um, all that I'll talk about that. Um, some of my worst picks, uh, there wasn't too many in this league, uh, which which I felt good about. Again, my drafting this this season, just on all my teams, I, I felt really solid about. I, I don't see a lot of missteps in the important areas. It was more mm -hmm. like some flyer picks that didn't pan out. Um, you know, maybe one out of my top seven in each league is like, okay, that's not the best. But um, in this particular draft, I picked uh, Vitek Vanacek at 146. Didn't mm -hmm. really work out. I mean, that's zero G. But I mean, Bobrovsky was out there. I could have got him two rounds later. Bobrovsky. So I think, um, you know, I think I should have like, we thought that um, he wasn't even going to get the net. In Florida, I think that's why he fell so far. Like, um, so that's that's that. Whatever, can't cry over spilled milk, can we, Nate? <laughs> no. Uh, but yeah, other than that, like, I thought my picks were solid. I felt great about the team, and I still do in hindsight when I'm looking at that. Like, um, I got Vitek Vanacek and Aiden Hill, and I end up dropping Vanacek. That's fine. So, yeah. anywho, um, that Forsberg that. pick. Oh that yeah. That, that that one feels good and i was talking about it when uh when your wi-fi was cutting out uh forsberg was one of the guys i mentioned i took batherson right before that mm -hmm. i distinctly remember like looking at it and i was like i really think i need to take a right wing here but there was guys there like forsberg was there um i forget who the other one was i was talking about reinhardt i think was one of them who i could have taken uh ended up being a little bit higher on batherson but that was definitely a mistake in retrospect yeah it was uh Konechny, Hedman, reinhardt forsberg all went in the next 10 picks and obviously forsberg being the best of them so uh hats off to you making the right pick there yeah i mean we were high on him like i don't know i i that's the great thing about having projections like i drafted off my projections for every team yep. and I'm, I'm happy with every draft more so than I ever have been in any year of fantasy hockey. So it's a no brainer. You need to get your projections out there, whether you're using Nate's or mine or someone else's like, um, or make your own. That's what you do. Don't go off Yahoo. Don't go off fan tracks. And that, that, that stuff makes no sense, right? You need like a, a tuned in fantasy guy, uh, or gal giving you some good information. So anyways, pro tip. All right. Expert. <laughs> right, Nate? Um, yeah. So I'm looking at my best ads for this team. I did add Joey Decord again on December 18th, and I got all that value out of him. I ended up punting him. That's fine. Blake Coleman, I got him as well again on this team and smashed. I loved it. December 11th, I think I actually got him before, and then I was like, I saw him in another league. I'm like, Blake Coleman's still there? Yeah, this guy's smashing. <laughs> I'm grabbing that. I love that. Uh, I got Thomas Hurdle on December 12th which actually turned into a, a trade that Nate and I did. So that, that was a nice little piece as well. 
and would have been good, you know, if I didn't trade him, like to have him for, for these Vegas games, like he's doing stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I also got Brock Faber on January 4th, kept them rest of the season. Besides, I did end up dropping him like for my finals week because I had a lot of Minnesota and they had a terrible schedule. But uh, lastly, I got Jordan Bennington, Mr. Ben in the sauce, uh, March 4th, and I wrote him into the playoffs to a second place finish. God dang. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, some of my worst drops. Again, I, there wasn't too many, too many egregious drops. Jarvis on November 16th for Raymond. I picked up Lucas Raymond and then I dropped him for like Casey DeSmith. So that right there is not very good, folks. All right. You don't drop Seth Jarvis and pick up Casey DeSmith, uh, <laughs> especially when Demko's not injured. All right. that That's, that's showing no good, but that's fine. Um, at that point too, in, you know, in fairness to me, like, yeah, he was, he was kind of being moved around the lineup. I think there was, there was times during the year where he was on power play too. And I think yep. that was during one of those times. I'm like, I'm not farting around with this, like, especially with RBA here, Brandon Moore doing his thing. I'm like, no, but uh, obviously when Gensel got in there and you got Jarvis stable to the top line, top power play, like this guy's popping off. So I think he's going to have a great year next year. Um, did you get Jarvis anywhere, Nate? I didn't look at your, your drafts here, but. No, no, I didn't end up with Jarvis anywhere. He was a, he was still a pretty trendy pick, so uh, I think he got picked up before I was ready to pull the trigger in most spots. Well, I'm a trendy guy, Nate. All right, when I go <laughs> out, I wear a black T-shirt, skinny jeans, and a teeny weeny beanie. Oh, <laughs> I do that. All right. Uh, <laughs> sorry. And then I also, again, Gus Nyquist, another guy, like probably should have held on to that guy. But how would we have known that he's just going to continue doing something he's never done before? on Nashville, who at times this season, they, they couldn't score. The only line scoring was their top line, but yep. they, they did it all year. It's crazy. Ryan O'Reilly and Gus Nyquist were like fantasy assets all year. What the hell? Um, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's a good data point there, right? Like I, I yep. don't think Nyquist is going to do this next season, but I mean, I'm definitely a little higher on him than I was, right? Like yeah. I, I probably projected him. I'd have to look at it, but it was probably for like 40 points or something. This guy's going for 70. So, I mean, we're probably looking at like a 55 point Nyquist next season or 60 maybe if he does, you know, everything right. And he, and he has 70 in the wheelhouse. It's insane. So anyways, uh, shout out to Gus Nyquist. That's fine. Let's talk about my trades. This is where this league was really fun. And this is where I beefed up my team to a ridiculous level. And Nate, I wasn't here when you were talking about it. So did you talk a little bit about pick swaps and things like that? I don't want to give a bunch of redundant information here. Yeah. Yeah. Basically all the pick swaps, we have to trade one pick for another. So um, that's why you'll see a later pick for a sooner pick on all of these trades pretty right. much between a, a team going for it and a team rebuilding. Yeah. So at, at one point in the season, I saw that I was in contention. I think I was second place already before I started making these trades. And literally after Nate and I did a podcast, we had like a, such a casual conversation. I'm like, Oh, you know, I, I don't even know how it came up, but like, I'm like, Oh, I like Zabanajad. And you're like, well, I'll trade him to you if you want. I was like, for who? Like, uh, I don't know. Who do you got? Like, he was so casual. He's like, ah, I don't know. What do you think? Like, oh, hurdle. Okay, I'll take Thomas Hurdle. Yeah, what do you want? Sixth or what did I give you? Like a fifth rounder or something? It's like, yeah, yeah sure, that seems fine. I was like, oh my God, I just got Zibby. <laughs> we got DJ Zibby. <laughs> um, so, anyways, uh, but that one really broke the dam open. So I made that trade with Nate, and then I just got my mind into that zone, right? And I feel like I made a lot of good trades. I'm really happy with the trades I made. Um, unfortunately, I traded away the farm. Like my team next year with picks, it's not going to be good. It's going to be really ugly. Nate, you just experienced this. I don't know if I went uh, as hard as you, giggity, but <laughs> you know, like I got nothing. Like I got nothing in the first few rounds next season. It's going to be pretty damn painful to draft. But anyways, um, so I did that one, that trade. I traded uh, Sean Monahan and a fourth for Vinny Tro and a 14th. And Trocek was amazing this year. Obviously, this guy redlined as well. He's got 77 points or something like that. I called Trocek for 70 points last season and everybody laughed at me. Not you, Nate, but everybody else. They <laughs> laughed at me and he didn't get 70 points. But um, 77 <laughs> this year, I knew he could do it. So there you go. I love Vinny Tro, friend of the show. Um, I also traded the coiler. I had him. All right. He filled the bowl and I'm like, buddy, this stinks. Get the hell out of there. What did you eat? Baby food? Um, I traded him and a six for uh, chicken necks, Chris Kreider and a 10th. So I was loading up obviously on the Rangers and their 
power play. The Rangers had an amazing schedule. Little did I know one of those weeks, uh, it was like a two game week. And then the next week was like four games with four yeah. off nights. So, but I survived the two game week. No problem. It was great. I was able to supplement. So I really thought I had the finals in the bag. Um, it just didn't happen that way. But I also uh, traded Valerie Nichushkin for Matt Boldy one for one. Um, when Nichushkin was out in the uh, player assistance program. So to me, that was really interesting. We talked about that one during the season, so I'm not going to go too much into that, but Boldy popped off after I got him. That really helped me secure first place, right? Yep. Um, so that was a great trade for me. Nichushkin didn't really do anything for my opponent. That's the guy I lost to in the finals. So Nichushkin did really pop off there. So it was a net positive for me. It was his other players that really smoked me. But um, I also traded John Gaudreau and a seventh rounder for Jordan Cairo and a 13th. Okay, didn't really work out. And then I traded uh, one for one John Tavares again for Philip Hronick straight up. All right. And yeah, that's this is an interesting trade because Tavares was doing well at the time when I traded him. But he wasn't making my lineup. He set, he's center only. And I needed, like, the reason I went for Hronik is because I thought I could get him first off. And Vancouver was one of those teams. It was that week where Vancouver and Buffalo were the only teams that were really rosterable. And so I thought, yeah, that makes total sense to me. And I made the trade. I gave up some value with Tavares. And he did really well after I traded him. But he wasn't getting into my lineup anyway. So it's one of those trades where both people sort of benefit um, I don't know. What do you think about trades like that, Nate? Yeah, I think it's, there's definitely points, especially late in the season. Like you got nothing left to play for that season, but to lay it all out there. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it looks, it looks terrible that Hronik was so cold and, uh, you got nothing, but I mean, if the guy's not going to play for you, like what value is he in mm -hmm. your lineup? So yeah, get him out there, get something in your lineup, get something, somebody who can score your points yeah. in the playoffs. Like, yeah, that's, that's what you got to do. You got to lay it all out there and try to bring it home. I will say you did go harder than I did. Um, so next year might be a little, a little painful for you in terms of, yeah, you traded your fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Um, so yeah, you're going to have your three keepers and not pick until the eighth round. So that's going to be, and I didn't win. Be. Oh God. Well, well, you you stayed in the money. You made your money back. You're free rolling for a couple of years. So uh, gotta I'm going to put that, that into a, a tax-free savings account. I'm going to look into it in 20 years. I'm going to make some serious bank, everybody. I'm super <laughs> stoked on that. Um, but yeah. So anyways, that's that league. There wasn't too much to take from it. I honestly felt like I did everything possible to bring home that chip. I drafted well. I streamed well in this league because um, I was really focused on it. And I knew the guys I was up against, right? Like yourself. Even though Nate wasn't really in contention a second. Uh, especially the second half, he was still there every day, you know, 3 a.m. Eastern time, <laughs> picking up the exact streamer that I wanted, like a dingus that he is. Um, so I just knew what I needed to do. So I streamed really well in this league. Um, yeah, I just got smoked in the finals. And, you know, for context, the team that I played against, he, he was the second place team, but he had the highest scoring week of any team in the entire season in the very, in the finals. So his team, like, just went off Every player went off. And to me, that that's just a bad beat. That's just, there's nothing really to learn from that. I feel like I did everything right. And I had a good week as well. I had the second highest, or maybe it's the third highest scoring week of the of that week there. But I mean, more than enough to win, but you can't win when you're when you're playing against that. So uh, we'll see what next week uh season brings. Could be ugly, but you know, I'll likely be looking to pick up some picks myself, probably pretty damn early. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. whatever, get out of here. I don't care. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at with that. Um, I yeah, it's a, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, it was, it was an interesting situation that developed in that league because you and Reese's Pieces were, like, far and away the points for leaders. Uh, you both went for it pretty hard in terms of trades. It was pretty clear to me. Like, that was one of the reasons that I chose not to, like, even attempt and started selling uh, players for picks and stuff was I just felt like one of the one of the two of you would be there at the end and would be crushing um, and everything would be going right. And, you know, that's fantasy hockey. Like, I don't, yeah. I think either of you had a really good shot to win that particular week. And it just so happened that his players had that week that they did and yours had a solid week, but not a, not a spectacular week that they would have needed to, to overcome it. So uh, that's, I mean, it's fantasy hockey, right? Like at the end of the day, yeah, um, right. When I looked at your two teams going into that, I was like, this is truly a coin flip. I could see this going either way. And uh, you win some and you lose some. And so, 
you know, you know, when I when I look at my leagues this year and I won three quarters of my leagues and I'm gonna clickbait title this episode yeah. how I won seventy five percent of my leagues this year, like I'm I'm very, very aware that like I when it comes down to it, like you're depending on a bunch of coin flips uh, to actually bring home the title in the final round. Like a lot of things have to go right uh, for you to get there in the end. Uh, but I do agree, like uh, in terms of like what you did, like I don't know what I would nitpick about what you did in order to put yourself in the best position possible to bring it home. So I think that sometimes there isn't much to take from it. You just get beat at the end and you got to tip your cap to the other guy and say, I'll see you next year. Yeah, absolutely. Shout out to Reese's Pieces, Pete. You're a dang legend, but I'm coming for you, buddy. You're on notice. All right. We don't do that. <laughs> all right. Um, I do have a third league here. Do you want me to get into it, Nate? I know we're getting up on time here. What do you think? Let's have it. Let's have it. The people oh, want it. Oh, hell yeah. Well, now I'm going to really take my time. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, this is the league that I really want to just bring a lot of attention to because it's the one I won. For God's sake. <laughs> oh, I, I, oh, I should have stopped. Yeah, I know. Uh, you had your no, chance. That's it. All right? we no, have that's it. it. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, um, it's going to be funny and I'll, I'll update this, you know, in a later pod, but like I'm, I'm on track to get like in both my points leagues that I'm still playing second place in both. I got second place in the experts league. Um, you know, uh, like there were so many chances for me to get second. Right. Mm -hmm. And I like last year it was third. I was in third. So, so next year next I should be getting year. some first place uh, finishes, but I was glad to bring home right. the chip in this one. This is the A and G listener league. It was awesome. Uh, great, great group of people there. 12 team points league head to head with the listeners. So uh, my record there, I was first overall 17 and five. Um, it was great. I, I finished, obviously I won the championship there. I was first overall in the regular season in points for it wasn't really close. Like, yeah, there was some teams like, and I'm not bragging. Like th this is more about like drafting, I think, because, uh, and I'll get into it, but like I did stream in here, but it, it was like, it was like tinkering. There was never anything where I was like, Oh, I need to get that streamer. Like there was a couple times where I'm like, eh, I'm fine. Like, like I'll just leave it. Like I know you and I talked about I'll use every ad. Like this is the only league of my five head to heads where I was like, sometimes I would have two out of four ads and I'd be like, nothing makes sense. Like I'm going to keep this team the way it is because it's good. I don't need to drop anybody. I don't want to drop anyone. They all have good schedules, whatever. Right. So, um, I picked it four in this league and, you know, obviously my best pick was my fourth overall pick, Nathan McKinnon. Um, how the Who hell? I got this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All Nathan's are beauties. That's confirmed. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, can they, can they do what this man does? I don't know. Nate, we, we still are waiting for that footage of your, of your hockey there. <laughs> yeah. My beard yeah that's going to be some nice uh, off season content. I know uh, <laughs> you see that uh, as do I. All right. Um, but yeah, Nathan McKinnon he picked him at fourth. He finished first overall in this league scoring. Clearly this guy's had a great season. So I picked, um, Sebastian Ajo at 69. Nice. nice. Oh, hell yeah. It was nice. He finished the 24th. So I love that. I mean, that was a little bit unexpected for me, for him to kind of pop off the way he did. Uh, I picked up Dobson, Noah Dobson at 76. He finished at 36. Again, I got Johnny Marcheseau at 93. He finished at 37. And then I got Cole Caulfield at 117, and he finished at 49. So those are a bunch of dubs right there. That's just set it and forget it kind of stuff, right? It's like I had those guys on my team. They're popping off like – you know what? I'm not going to be dropping any of those guys. I'm just going to ride them into the sunset. And that's kind of what happened. So, um, a lot of really good draft picks there. Um, my worst picks, I did take, uh, take a ride with Timo Meyer at 28 here. That's the highest I drafted Meyer. I got him in two spots this year. That's the highest I took him. I think I got him at like 37 in the other league. I took him in a points league, but yeah, I mean, I'm glad to see that Meyer is thriving now and hopefully they can use this as a data point moving into next season like this is what this man needs to to mm -hmm. produce right he needs 19 minutes out there he needs access to the best players on the team he needs power play one like what are we doing right and i really do like this is something lindy ruff said this year too timo meyer was battling an injury this year throughout the, the year so we didn't see full timo we didn't see full timo time so that that's a player i'm low-key interested in at value next season right if he's going to 28 next season hell no like but he, I, there's no way he would not with this production this season so but anyways, I picked him at 28. He finished at 99. That show ain't no good. Um, Zach Wierenski, I picked him at 45. I'm high on the player, but I think I could have waited a little bit there on Zach Wierenski. Like, that's my that's my fourth pick there. Mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, that was my first defenseman. I took Zach Wierenski. Like, I, 
I, I probably could have waited there. I don't remember who was available at the time, but I mean, Wierenski was great. Would you like me to tell season. you? Yeah, tell me. Um, Nate, while you're looking at that, like, yeah, Wierenski finished at 105. So I got him at 45. He finished at 105. Obviously, I like the player, but I mean, who who else was in that range, Nate? Uh, well, the next two picks were Jake Gensel and Artemi Panarin. So clearly not missing on anything there. Uh, Panarin? <laughs> no! God, I didn't need to know that. Uh, <laughs> But I mean, did anyone predict that Panarin would up his sh shots per 60 numbers the way that he has and and almost close to eclipsing 50 goals? Did you think that was in the realm of possibilities with Panarin? Nate? No, I didn't. No, I, I definitely don't think it was, it was totally crazy. I will say like the next three defensemen were Chikrin, Morrissey, and Hedman. Two out of those three you'd rather have had than Wierenski mm -hmm. this year. I mean, Wrensky had a terrific season when all is said and done, but yeah, maybe round four uh, feels a little early still. But I don't think I don't think that sunk your team. No, not at all. I mean, I won, but that that was a fix. I wish I, <laughs> I won. I wish I, I won. Um, <laughs> I wish I could have, uh, yeah, made a bit bit more of a value pick there. That like we were big on Columbus going into it, and then all this garbage happened with Mike yeah. Mike Babcock and you know, and then Pascal Vincent getting in here like. It's just been mismanaged. They fired their GM finally. So hopefully, you know, and hopefully Line A gets healthy and we get what we should see there in Columbus of good players, like, you know, well coached. I mean, that we won't get the well coached part until Vincent's uh, uh, fired, but, you know, still, um, there was a lot of hope there. So I think we, we both had Wierenski for like 20 goals, right? Like, yep. and, he, and he didn't really get there, but yeah, amazing assist numbers. Wierenski had a great season. Anywho, um, yeah, Wierenski at 45. I picked Big Koozie at 172. I probably shouldn't have done that. All right. That that's I mean, I don't know. I I liked I thought there was some value there because I, you know, my take on Koozie going into the season. He's attached to Patterson. I think he's gonna get more ice time. He's gonna be prioritized more. Like little did I realize, like the guy can't play defense. All right. And he pisses his coaches off and they don't want him out on the ice. So fair enough, right? I mean, he's training in Bali on like a set of stairs, like buddy. Get in the gym, you ding dong. All right. And, you know, stop buying so much conditioner and get your buns into the gym. All right. Get on an assault bike for the love of Pete. Um, anyways, I'm digressing on Big Koozie. I love that man. Um, picked Verona again at 189. Uh, both those picks there, Kuzmenko and Verona, there, there was better players available. Like Brock Besser was available at that time. Robert Thomas was there. Right. So mm. they're just two wasted picks. I mean, at 172 and 189, who cares? Right. Yeah. But, I could, I mean, I should have picked Besser. I knew I should have picked Besser at that point. Um, it just felt, I, I don't know. I think I, I wanted to have Kuzi on my team, right? And I think <laughs> that's kind of what I did there. So that's that's really that play there. Um, my goalies on this team, who did I pick? Uh, Linus Allmark at, at 165. And then Vegetable Lasagna, uh, Carol Vamelka. I got him with my last pick at 213. Promptly dropped his bum because I didn't need that. All right. <clears throat> so... Let's talk about my best ads, all right, that led me to victory. I added Jordan Bin in the sauce again, all right. Uh, November 13th, I held him rest of the season. So my goalies didn't change in this league. This was one league where I just kept the guys I had because um, our goalie scoring in this league, it, it's nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. That's one thing too. You got to check your scoring settings, right? Like you did the fantasy or the fantasy puck creators league where goalies had big waiting, didn't they, Nate? Like yep. in, in this league, um, these are these are Kakupful settings, but last year Kakupful settings where they like this year in Kakupful they actually added some points to saves, they added some points to wins, right? Um, whereas this this season is still like no, so, like <laughs> so I didn't care really who my goalies were. I just wanted guys that I knew would give me a good chance to get some points, right? And Linus Olmark, they did the you know the 50-50 split. I mean maybe more like the 60-40 uh, leaning Swayman's way, but that's fine. Olmark gave me great starts when he was in there, and then Bennington, yeah, he had a low key good season. This is the type yep. of guy you probably want on your team, right? It's a great zero G option because you don't have to spend any draft capital to get him. I added him off waivers for God's sake, and I kept them all year. So. Uh, those are good. I added all, uh, Matthias Ekholm again, February 24th, kept him rest of the season. That was great. And to me, like worst drops in this particular team, there's nothing egregious at all. I went through all my drops. I was like, nothing like, oh my God, what was I doing there? Um, like again, Nyquist, uh, I dropped a bunch of times, added him a couple times, dropped him again. Co big koozie. I added him, dropped him a couple times. Big deal, right? Didn't, didn't cost me anything. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, in terms of trades, I, I only made one and it was offered to me, which is kind of nice. Like someone was just like, does anybody want Dylan cousins for the playoff schedule? I was like, 
okay. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we just made a one for one trade. I traded Luke Hughes straight up for Dylan Cousins. And I was happy to have it. I kept Dylan Cousins for that good playoff schedule. He did okay, right? Um, he really cooled off kind of towards the end there, but he had a little stretch of, of nice play. It's a tinkering trade. It was nothing. So, but honestly, the takeaways here, it's just like, it just went really well. This league went really well. I, I felt like I didn't have to pay attention to this league. I'm not, I'm not slighting anything. Like, it's just, this is how my draft went and how my players, it, like things just worked really well, right? My top guys really performed and I didn't find myself going stream crazy because I was getting great production, right? And like I said, when I needed to, I would stream, but I was solid at every position. I made the most moves in this league here as well, but it was down from my numbers that I normally do. Um, yeah, so I'm just happy to say I was able to like, like, first off, two of my losses, um, came against the same guy and I ended up playing that guy in the finals <laughs> and I whooped that biscuit. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, it was good. So yeah, shout out to him. But, uh, yeah, I was able to avenge that loss when it mattered most. And again, of my five losses, four of those losses were 10 points or under 10 points or under on four. So everything went right. I could have had an, uh, almost an undefeated season. Right. So, um, that said, like, this is not something we could bank on to happen too often. I was really grateful for this league, like just because it made me feel good. Right. Cause in couple <laughs> scratching and clawing, like, please, like, can you just, I need that dub. Um, but this one, I was like, I could just kind of set it and forget it. Just look over and be like, Oh, I want another matchup. Great. Okay. So, but that, that's really it. I mean, anything, anything you see there in that league, Nate, yeah, no, I think it's definitely uh, another case where, uh, yeah, drafting solidly, getting good value on a bunch of guys. I mean, you had a big hit there with Dobson too. Uh, that made a big difference for sure. But yeah, overall, uh, just a pretty solid effort uh, front to back. You had, a, you had some decent competition in here. Like you, mm -hmm. I'm just looking at it now. You had 5,900 fantasy points on the season. Uh, the guy that you're mentioning who you faced in the finals had uh 5800 yeah another at 5700 so he had some company at the top uh for sure in this league but um yeah overall i think uh i think this one was fairly textbook and i can't really again poke a lot of holes in what you did here you damn skippy buddy um i did want to give a quick summary here just on on some of the other leagues that not even close to the uh, what I just did there, but, um, I, there was a, a 16 team full bangers cats league. It was probably my worst showing of the year. Um, so I definitely want to mention that. And I didn't make the playoffs there. I think I was 10th out of 16 and yeah, like, and this is kind of to it, to the point we were talking about a little bit earlier, but, um, zero G definitely the way, but I feel like I might've waited a bit too long to grab a goalie or I might've grabbed the wrong goalie at that time. You know what I mean? Like, and, and that's something I want to dive into a little bit in the off season here is like category leagues and specific strategy for category leagues. Um, you know what, what we're looking for, because it's a 16 teamer and basically that means like depends on who you get, like the wire is bare, especially to start the season, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's kind of scary. So you, you're losing those matchups. You're almost punting the goalies, the goalie categories, right? And I felt like I was doing that a little bit at the beginning of the season. I think I had, like I drafted something like, yeah, Vimelka was one of my guys and like Philip Grubauer, right? Those are my mm -hmm. two guys and they didn't start very well. But I mean, throughout the year too, like I had Decord, I had UPL, I had Ingram at times, you know, during the season and I dropped them probably be before they took off. Right. So I think my zero G management was probably the worst in that league. And I think there's some, some takeaways there that I just need to look at and like dive into my ads and drops and see, and maybe hang on a little bit more too. Right. But, um, yeah, that's, that, that's an interesting league. Cats leagues is something I want to focus on moving forward next year. And then in my dynasty leagues, one of them was the A and G dynasty league. And uh, I just missed out on the playoffs there. That's an 18 teamer. I play seventh. Um, I was only eight points out of the lead. Again, my goalies were an issue there. That's a category league as well. And I have Jake Ottinger, who didn't play amazing this year, but then I had a bunch of backups. Like I had Laurent Brassois and like Kevin Lankin and Kevin Lankin. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, I, I wasn't getting goalie starts enough goalie starts. And again, it's a big league. I think it's a 18 teamer again. So like, there's no one on the wire you can pick up. So that, that was kind of an issue. And then I was actually in a full, I don't know if you ever played a, a full salary cap league, Nate, have you? I haven't. No, it's, it's an experience, man. Like, and I got to say, I was out of my element for sure. I got pumped. It wasn't great. I, again, I liked my drafting. I drafted off all my, my projections and everything, but I mean, it, it's, it's just another element, right. That I'm not familiar with. So, um, you know, and I, I think, 
honestly, like it's, it was just one of the lower leagues on my radar as well. Like I, I didn't mm-hmm. really give it the time that it needed, whereas other managers really were right. So anyways, I think I'll probably give, get rid of that one. It's a bit too much for me to keep track of, but it was fun and well run. I don't know, but yeah, that that's about all I got. My guy, what, what do you got to say? Seems like you had a solid season. Uh, I mean, the results, the results didn't come through for you, especially a good couple. I can't believe that first and second in points for in consecutive years and miss the playoffs in both. That's pretty tough luck uh, in back to back <laughs> years in good couple. So, uh, but it looks like with the new system there, you'll be moving up a couple of divisions anyway. So, I'm sure you'll be on your way up uh, to join me in tier one uh, Ooh, sooner rather than that'd later. That'd be so but... epic, buddy. You and me in tier one. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Oh, God. It could be a couple years, but, you know. That's... <laughs> uh, yeah. Overall, I, I, I think it was a, a really successful season um, in totality for both of us, for Apples and Genos as brand. Um, yeah, obviously... We're going to dig into everything even more in the off season. So if you made it this far, I mean, if you're 94 minutes into an episode that's coming at the end of the fantasy hockey season, then uh, clearly you're some kind of uh, degenerate just like us. So, oh yeah. Um, yeah. You'll want to We know see that. you. Yeah. We're going to be here all off season long. Uh, yeah. Zero G episode will be coming once I've had a chance to dive into those stats, uh, put together my usual, um, yeah. Recap on the, uh, points that were scored how different goalies performed at different points throughout the season so on and so forth um yeah we're gonna dig into our projections compare them to other projections see how we performed um try to take some uh, takeaways from that so we can get better once again next year but yeah i think i think quite honestly blake like the proof is in the pudding for both of us here um and the way that we were able to draft and have good teams uh, and at least be around it in every single league. Um, I feel like we, uh, we drafted well and our projections have a lot to do with that. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty confident in the, in the product here and in the results as well. Um, so overall, Hell yes. I think it was pretty successful. Uh, last order of business, unfortunately, I'm going to recap the head-to-head streamer death match. Uh, it's still ongoing. We've still got, uh, you know, the rest of this week for it to go. But uh, you picked Andre Kuzmenko, and that is the absolute trump card of the year because Kuzmenko has scored 36 couple points in four games somehow. Uh, I picked Thomas Hurdle, and he's had a nice week. Like, he's had 19.75 points. I haven't looked back, but that probably would have won a fair number of our, our matchups the, on the year in uh, in terms of one-week matchups. Uh, but, yeah, uh, what am I going to say? It looks like Kuzmenko's going to run away with this one unless Hurdle has a has a four-goal game left in him here somewhere. <laughs> it it uh, that might be all she wrote. Uh, so, yeah. Like we already knew, it is going to be Blake on the season uh, for the Head Dead Streamer Death Match. Um, we'll have to come up with a, a better name for it next year. As Blake mentioned, I don't want to be expired. So no, yeah, that's, we'll, we'll let's figure avoid it out. Yeah. Uh, we'll edit it in post, but uh, that's going to be all that we've got for this episode. Hopefully it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at Fantasy Hockey today. All the advanced stats you didn't hear today came from Natural Statric, which is a terrific free resource. Many thanks to the band there there for supplying music for the podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. That's it, folks. Much love. Mm-hmm.